Hello everyone, my name is Alexis Carlton and I'm going to start off our community-based interventions and practice model. We are discussing the sexual and reproductive health, specifically with adolescent and teen pregnancy prevention. We'll first begin by discussing the health problem itself. So according to the CDC, teens or adolescents are those in the age range between 15 to 19 years of age. So as we go throughout this presentation, often we're going to reference teens or adolescents and that 15 to 19 year age range is what we're discussing. So for some statistics, one out of every 10 new mothers is a teen mother. And there are a lot of problems that are associated with teen pregnancy, making it a community and health problem. So those who are teen mothers often find it challenging to complete their education. This leads to low paying jobs financial hardship, and other ne things necessitating government assistance, which is paid out by the taxpayers. And in addition, children of teen mothers have an increased probability of health problems versus those who are born to adult mothers. So in recent years, the public has begun to glamorize teen pregnancy, and the CDC points out that this could shape young adult minds and allow them to think that teen, being a teen parent would lead to fame or some kind of you know, benefit to themselves. So teen pregnancy should be a priority because of the enormous burden it puts on teen parents, their families, and the children born to teen parents in addition to the economy. Now, while this might sound harsh, girls born to teen parents are 33% more likely to become teen mothers themselves, making this a revolving cycle that must be broken. And teen pregnancy takes a financial toll on taxpayers. The U.S. teen birth rates are nine times higher than most other developing countries, which costs more than $9 billion each year to taxpayers. In addition, expanding further upon my previous comment about education of teen mothers, only about 50% of teen mothers receive a high school diploma by age 22, while 90% of non-teen mothers receive their diplomas by age 22. This also has an implication for teen fathers as well. So 50% of teen fathers finish their high school education or get the GED by age 22, which is four years after the average high school graduation age. And this causes additional financial hardships for the teen parents if they decide to stay together. Many people share in the responsibility of preventing teen pregnancy. First off, the teens themselves must have the ability to abstain from sexual intercourse or know what to do when they engage in sexual intercourse. And the problem arises when there's no parental guidance or when there's no mentor that the teen can look up to in order to get accurate information. And in situations like this, oftentimes they look towards their peers to give them advice about sexual activity. And oftentimes that advice isn't exactly accurate. So parents have to sit down with teens and have the quote unquote birds and bees talk while they're still young. But some parents mistake the age that teens are beginning to have intercourse and therefore they miss out on the ability to have the conversation before the teens have already begun engaging in sex. Now only about 44% of girls and 27% of boys have had the conversation with their parents about birth control or abstinence and this creates a huge problem. This leads to the skewed belief that you know things like having intercourse while a woman's on her menstrual cycle can prevent pregnancy which as we all know, is not the case. And sexual and reproductive education should be mandated in schools, and it should be stressed that abstinence is key, or at least that condom use or other preventative methods should be used when they engage in sexual activity. Now, when I was looking up statistics for this project, I was surprised at the fact that only 44% of girls and 53% of boys have had formal sexual education and you don't really know what's happening with the other percentages, whether they've had any kind of sexual education from parents or mentors at all, or whether it's purely just been information from their friends. So we now move on to discuss teen and adolescent pregnancy at a nationwide level. So when we look at how the United States ranks internationally against other developed countries, we are the second highest in rates of teen birth Within the United States, states such as Arizona, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama have the highest rate of teen births, births per 1,000. 
So it's about 51 to 64 teen births per 1,000, and that's from a study done in 2009. And to compare, and I'll get to Michigan in a minute, but to compare to Michigan, we have about 31 to 40 teen births per 1,000. So we're right about in the middle of where, you know, all the other states rank. So minorities like Hispanics, or African Americans have the highest rate of teen births, and they had it in both 1991 and 2009. And so looking at the statistics um, shown by the CDC, these rates of minority pregnancy, teen pregnancy are increasing faster than other majority populations such as white Americans and things like that. And while it seems like the rate of teen pregnancy has been decreasing, there is still a much higher rate of teen pregnancy with minority groups versus white non-Hispanic Americans. Moving on to discuss teen and adolescent pregnancy within Michigan or locally. So again, to repeat what I said earlier, in 2009, Michigan had anywhere between 31 and 40 teen births per 1,000 for teen moms. And within this age group, when you break it down, it's been demonstrated that the age range of about 18 to 19 year olds have the highest rate of teen pregnancy per 1,000 followed after by the rage of 15 to 19 year olds. So this is the entire span of the age range that we're looking at for teen pregnancies. That was about 31.6 teen pregnancies per 1,000. And then on the lower end of the spectrum, 15 to 17 year olds have the lowest rate of teen pregnancies at 13.3 pregnancies per 1,000 females. Now in Michigan, non-Hispanic black teens have a teen pregnancy rate that's about 2.6 times higher than white teens, which follows very closely in line with what we see at a national level. And looking at the cities that have the highest teen birth rates, the highest teen birth rate is seen in Pontiac, followed next by Saginaw, and finally by Jackson. So next we're going to look at the population at risk. The first thing we're going to discuss is teens living in rural counties or communities or things of that nature. So teens that are living in these rural communities are often outside of the reach of some of the better established pregnancy prevention programs. This means that the job of educating them on intercourse and prevention, abstinence, things of that nature, falls on the shoulders of the community or the parents. And oftentimes there's not a strong educational foundation there for them to give accurate information to their children or to be able to get the information to their children, teens, adolescents in time before they start engaging in intercourse. And then teens that come from low education status communities or families, like I said already, often at lacks education that's needed from parents or community members to teach the teens how to abstain or have safe intercourse. As well, teens coming from neighborhoods that have racial segregation, poor environmental conditions, or few opportunities for positive youth involvement have these very same issues. Finally, risks facing teen parents and infants. I thought it was interesting to include this slide because while most prevention programs look at, you know, the bigger picture on everything, I thought it was very important to focus on the types of risks specifically facing, you know, the teen parents and the infants and things, because that's also very important. So the risks to teen parents and children born to teen parents are often much higher than what's faced by adult parents and the children also born to these adult parents. So the infants that are born to teen mothers often have a lower birth weight due to a variety of factors such as inadequate nutrition on part of the mother, the fact that the mother herself is still developing, or a general lack of knowledge about important things such as folic acid early in pregnancy. And adolescent mothers also face risks that adult mothers don't. So for example, an adolescent mother's body might not have developed enough to have birth naturally without complication. Like for example, her hips haven't widened enough to let the baby's head pass through the birth canal. Um, there's also added stress financially when caring for a child while, you know, a teen mother's career hasn't been established. She doesn't have the funds that she needs. She doesn't even have health insurance that she's assigned to by herself. Oftentimes she's under, you know, her parents' health insurance. And then the kid has to go and 
you know, fall under the state's care and things like that. It just becomes really messy. And there are also risks involved with the family of the teen mom because they could, will often have to struggle to support an additional child that they didn't account for in their finances. And there can also be a risk of abandonment um, of the teen mother by her family if she comes from, say, someone with a very religious background or, you know, depending on the type of financial situation, turmoil and things of that nature. She often runs the risk of having to raise the kid by herself without any support from her parents. And in addition, adolescent fathers also struggle more than adult fathers. There's a strong likelihood of becoming a high school dropout, which makes it harder to provide economic stability for the mother and child if the parents happen to stay together. And there's also emotional stress. So if the father decides not to stay with the mother or things of that nature, it creates problems if you know, you're seeing each other in school and things like that, and just the kind of stigma that people feel about you when you're abandoning the mother of your child. But oftentimes this happens more with adolescent parents than it does with adult parents who are often either in long-term committed relationships or are planning on having children before they actually have children. So this completes my section. We're gonna move on to health programs presented by Katie. Hello everyone, I'm Katie Lukovich. We're gonna to present to you the health programs that we have researched. The first program is called Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan. This program operates on the state level in Michigan with the goal of lowering the rate of teenage pregnancy through education about practicing abstinence and the use of contraceptives. The Michigan-based program targets youth, men and women ages 12 to 19, focusing on populations that have a high risk for teen pregnancy. These special populations include African Americans and those living in the cities that have over 100 teen births, including the city of Detroit, Flint, and Lansing, just to name a few. The next program we chose to highlight is called the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program, or TPP. This program is a nationwide program which provides funds to promising programs preventing teenage pregnancy. The funded programs must demonstrate success in one or more of the following areas. Proven evidence-based programs preventing teenage pregnancy, which also provides referrals to youth-friendly services. Building up youth community service programs to sustain evidence-based pregnancy prevention programs. Supporting technology and, and programs that are not ready to be implemented, yet they look promising in the teen pregnancy prevention. And evaluating new approaches to preventing teen pregnancy in minority populations. We will dive further into these programs throughout this presentation. We will now present the 2020 goals and objectives. Healthy People 2020 listed two goals related to teen pregnancy. The first goal is the prevention of unintended pregnancies, and the second is the prevention of pregnancy in adolescents. Both programs we talked about succeeds in meeting both of those goals. The Michigan-based program meets Healthy People 2020 goal of preventing teenage pregnancy by providing education to both youth and parents about behaviors that increase the risk of pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases, and also creating community awareness by distributing educational materials to communities at high risk for teenage pregnancy. Two of Healthy People's 2020 goals are met with the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. The first goal is prevention of unintended pregnancies. This is seen in a TPP funded program from the University of Southern California called Keeping It Real Together. The second goal is the prevention of teenage pregnancy. Below, you will see a few examples of states with programs meeting this goal. Hi, I'm Malad Bezzi. I'll be discussing the interventions of both programs that we are addressing. The Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan is a 
through the Michigan Department of Community Health, and it has multiple teen pregnancy prevention and parenting programs. The, pro, the goal of the program is to reduce the rate of teen pregnancy in Michigan. One uh, particular program is the Taking Pride in Prevention. The, uh, the program targets youth and young adults between the ages of 12 and 19. It focuses on the African American within the city of Detroit or other cities that have more than 100 teen births. It's designed to educate adolescents on both absence and contraception to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. They also have three adulthood preparation subjects with the health relationships, adolescent development, and parent and child communication. So upon completion of the evidence-based prevention program, participants will be able to will have more knowledge about the behaviors that increase the risk of the pregnancy and the uh, sexual transmitted infections. They will also have the communication and intervention skills to avoid unsafe sexual intercourse. They will be able to be aware of using condoms and contraceptions to prevent pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections. Parents also will also have the necessary skills to communicate effectively with their children regarding sexuality, absence, and condom and contraceptive um, use. The second program we are addressing is the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. The Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program is a national evidence-based program that funds diverse organizations working to prevent teen pregnancy across the United States. The Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program reaches adolescents the ages of 9, 10 to 19 with a focus on population with the greatest need in order to reduce teen pregnancy and birth rates. One example of the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program is the Teen Option to Prevent Pregnancy. Uh, which is a rapid pregnancy program that provides mo motivational interviewing, contraceptive access, and social services support over the month of 18, uh, 18 month period to help at risk teen mothers develop and follow a birth control plan and to prevent pregnancies. The program is delivered by a trained nurse through home and telephone based care coordination. An option to prevent a pregnancy has three compartments to it. The first compartment is motivational interviewing, which is an 18-month one-on-one home and telephone motivational interviewing session with a nurse educator focusing on preventing pregnancy and the use of birth control methods. The second component of the program is the access to contraception, which improves access to con contraception by offering access to, to clinics transportation services, and or in-person discussion about the importance of contraceptives. The third program component is the assessment and referrals by a social worker, which provide a, provides participant access to social workers. The theory behind this service is the referral addressing other barriers that teens face, such as poverty, trauma, homelessness, which eventually help them follow a birth, birth control routine. These pro components of the program are designed to increase regular use of contraception, which in return will lead to the program's desired goals of promoting healthy birth spacing and reducing rapid repeat teen births. Comparing both programs, the both programs were addressed at, as evidence-based programs, which were based on the effect of specific intervention of reducing teen pregnancy and increasing their use of contraceptive models. However, both programs had their differences. The population of the programs varied within the focus groups. The Teen Pregnancy Initiative of Michigan focused on the ages of 12 to 19 years old, while the Teen Options to Prevent Pregnancy focused on ages 10 to 19. The Teen Pregnancy Initiative of Michigan focused on African Americans within the city of Detroit, while the teen option to prevent pregnancy focused on Caucasians. The program length of the Teen Pregnancy Initiative of Michigan is directed to 8, eight to 10 hours, and the teen option to prevent pregnancy is designed for a longer period of 18 months. The setting also varied within the two groups.
the Teen Pregnancy Initiative of Michigan is set throughout the state of Michigan, while the Teen Option to Prevent Pregnancy setting is in multiple health clinics like hospitals, home visits, and also telephone counseling. The educators of the programs have also varied. The Teen Pregnancy Initiative of Michigan are not medical are medical health care providers who were not who were not further specified. The teen option to prevent pregnancy is delivered by trained nurses, nurses and social workers. Hi, my name is Gina Lacola and I'm going to be discussing the desired and actual outcomes of the program. For the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan, um, they had short-term, mid-term, and long-term desired outcomes that they intended to fulfill through the many programs they fund, some of which include the youth being able to report a better understanding of risky behaviors for pregnancy and STIs, and increased youth and community membership. But in general, their long-term outcomes were or are the delaying of sexual activity by youth served by the program as a result of its evidence-based programming, a decreased likelihood for teens served by the program to become teen parents or contract an STI or HIV, promote an ongoing dialogue about healthy sexuality and abstinence, and an overall decrease in the rate of teen pregnancy, STIs, and HIV due to the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative Program. Regarding the actual outcomes of the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan, each program is evaluated separately based on its main topic, such as using contraceptives, risks of AIDS, HIV, and STIs, practicing, practicing abstinence, etc. But the specific measuring techni techniques are not listed on the home page. Along with this, actual raw outcome data was not published online. I could not find anything that um, <clears throat> represented the evaluation of the programs and any data. Um, but CDC reported that Michigan's teen birth rate has been decreasing and is currently below the national rate at 19.14 births per 1,000 births. They also cited teen pregnancy prevention programs such as the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan as partly responsible for this decrease. So although the actual data was not available, it seems that these programs are working and meeting their outcomes. So the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program um, has desired outcomes, and through the combined work of the program it funds, it has three main desired outcomes. Uh, the first of which is increased abstinence and delayed onset of sexual activity among pre-adolescent adolescent males and females, reduced rates of youth engaging in health-related risk behaviors, including but not limited to risky sexual behaviors, and decreased incidence of teen pregnancies and births, STIs, and HIV infection. The success of these outcomes is measured by analyzing the following eight areas of each program. Sexual activity, number of sexual partners, frequency of sexual activity, contraceptive use and or consistency, sexual initiation and abstinence, pregnancy or birth, HIV and STIs, and pregnancy. Data collection and outcome measurement is completed by serving participants at different times during and after program completion. Regarding the actual outcomes of TPP, based on the surveys regarding the eight measurable areas listed in the last slide, all programs showed evidence of effect in at least one outcome, and many programs showed evidence of effect in three or more outcomes. Other data collection regarding performance measurement found that from 2016 to 2017, number of participants increased, information delivery and participant understanding increased, dissemination of information increased, and observer-related quality and fidelity increased. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services found that all 37 programs were effective based on the data collected for each program. And this data is based on findings such as in schools that delivered the program, participants were significantly less likely to initiate sexual activity by the end of eighth grade. And students who participated in the intervention were significantly less likely to initiate sexual activity or report having unprotected sex in the past three months since participating in the program. From these findings, we can infer that TPP is effective in working towards the completion of its outcomes and is having an increasingly greater effect on the community, communities that the programs work with. With the help of teen pregnancy prevention programs such as TPP, the teen pregnancy rate in the United States is at a record low with a decrease, 9% decrease from 2014. For women aged 15 to 19 years, birth rates fell 9%, and for women aged 18 to 19 years, birth rates fell 7%.
Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Ali, and I will be talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the programs that we discussed. So first we're going to be talking about the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan. So some of its strengths. Um, the focus is on African American teens, and this is a demographic group with the greatest number of teen pregnancies. Um, it, this program not only provides education on contraception options, but it also uh, promotes abstinence. Um, there's a maintenance of parental involvement in the program because parents do need to be involved in the lives of their teenagers when discussing this very important matter. Um, and it also includes confidence and self esteem building activities and exercises. So, looking at some of the weaknesses of this program, it is somewhat exclusive for ethnicity and possibly even gender because it does focus on African American teens. And it's not to say that um, teenagers from other ethnic groups don't have um, the issue of adolescent pregnancies. And there's also no mention of teenage boys being involved in this or welcome into this because it's just important for teenage boys to know about, you know, the dangers of STIs and all the risks associated with teen pregnancies and all that. Um, if you look at the grantees, um, there's only one Detroit hospital mentioned. It's Henry Ford Hospital and there's, what, three or four hospitals in the Tri-County area. So maybe they can, and Detroit's a really big city. So, you know, they somebody may be on the opposite side of town and may not be able to get to that hospital if they need help or uh, anything of the sort. Um, no mention of like a phone number for like a hotline, um, questions. You know, sometimes there's a difference between reading something and having somebody explain it to you. Um, no outreach program to schools. They're kind of limited to just like urgent cares, Planned Parenthood, um, one hospital. Um, and there's no... Um, actual raw data published. I understand it's new, but um, there's no uh, measuring techniques of any sort to determine the success of this program. So some of the strengths of the teen pregnancy prevention program, it is on the national level. It's in a lot of states. Michigan's not one of them yet, but they do have um, a very broad influence. It utilizes um, technology outreach to schools, clinics, um, churches, community-based interventions, all that. Um, it's not exclusive for any sort of ethnic group or racial group. So everybody's involved and everybody can have um, a say or get help or anything like that. Uh, there's a diverse number of grantees. If you look on their website, they have churches, um, clinics, university medical centers, um, a whole bunch of places that um, these teens can go to if they need help. Um, it's a good growth rate. The performance from last year, 2016, was 65,000, and that shot up to 213,000 in 2017. So that's almost like just a little under a 3.5 um, growth rate in just a year. Um, a few of the weaknesses um, of this program. Currently, there's no grantee in Michigan and they really haven't provided an estimate as to when they will reach Michigan. They do have um, outreach in a lot of states at the moment. Michigan's just not one of them. And then when they do get to Michigan, is there going to be competition with the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Ini Initiative in Michigan? Are they going to take over? Because if uh, with the TPPP being on a national scale, they've got bigger grants, um, more influence. So... Uh, would they eventually merge or kind of knock it out, or we really don't know. So some of the concepts or theories that we've learned so far in class can be applied to both of these programs. So looking at the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative in Michigan, um, one model that we've studied that comes to mind is the precaution adoption process model. And this pretty much talks about taking precaution against something. In this case, it would be um, adolescents who decide to engage in sexual intercourse, avoid getting pregnant, avoid getting an STI, um, in addition to um, being uh, well-versed in the various forms of contraception and whatnot. 
So this um, organization, I feel, does a really good job in explaining because they do provide a very lengthy workshop. So by the end of it, not only are these teens well-versed in the various forms, they also have a good knowledge base. And there's also that parental involvement. So there is that level of comfort that I feel that um, a teenager can have with their parent if they're going to discuss something like this. Uh, community mobilization is another one, and uh, that's collective action by a community member, groups, organizations to create change. And of course, this change is um, to for the um, teen pregnancy rate to drop. And that's also that also includes you know um, uh, reaching out to communities, um, educating, and all that. And of course, that is a uh, goal according to the Healthy People 2020 um, uh, program. The second one is, or third one, I'm sorry, is cultural anthropology. And I feel this has to do with like social norms. Um, teens may live in a community where they see a lot, a lot of teenage mothers. Um, their parents could have also been teens themselves when they had, um, when uh, this child was born. So it might not be seen, seen as unusual to them, but I think explaining this statistics that were explained earlier in regards to um, mothers uh, or adolescent mothers having uh, lower education rates, lower earning power, uh, more likely to develop health problems. Um, hopefully this can pretty much sway their decision if they feel that, you know, having a baby is not exactly the wrong thing to do at a, uh, in their teen years. So looking at the teen pregnancy prevention program, um, these are the few of the um, uh, concepts and applications that come to mind that we've learned about. First one is the precaution adoption process model or PAPM. And it pretty much is about taking precaution against something. In this case, it would be um, teens deciding whether or not to engage in um, sexual intercourse or if they do decide um, at least to make sure that they use protection. And it starts with, you know, are they aware of it? Do they even care? And this program can do a really good job in um, explaining all the dangers associated with, you know, risky sexual behavior, um, not just pregnancy, but again, like STIs, and, you know, the, and they're left untreated can just become even worse. The second one is the social network theory. And this, the goal of this theory is to identify the research and identify the important characteristic, characteristics of a network. I guess the network in this case would be um, adolescents. And you reach out to these uh, individuals to make sure that they have the right information about uh, the dangers of unprotected sex. Um, you know, all the uh, risks that go with... Um, Adolescent, becoming pregnant in your adolescence, um, you know, down, especially not just at that moment, but down the road with, um, as mentioned before, uh, you know, less earning power, um, uh, being uh, relying on government assistance, uh, developing health problems, and not just for women, but for uh, men as well. Um, next would be community mobilization. And this is just uh, again uh, community members, groups, organizations um, reaching out to this uh, group of individuals and making sure that they are aware, um, empower, um, providing them with knowledge, empowering communities to make right decisions. Uh, organizational change is another thing or another. Um, concept, sorry. Uh, and this is pretty much what um, we can say about community mobilization. And it's pretty much encouraging shared goals and missions. Um, and in this case, it would be um, to reduce teen pregnancies, um, making sure they're well-versed in the various forms of protection, making sure they're using protection, or pretty much 
um, if they, you know, what would be best would be to abstain from that if they um, know the risks. Uh, and the last one would be the ecological system theory. Uh, this is a multi-level approach that involves um, family, schools, neighborhoods, local organizations, national organizations, um, I mean, healthcare centers, clinics, you name it, to um, understand outcomes for behavior and find solutions to those behaviors. So the, the TPPP, it being on like a national scale and having so much more grant funding and all that, um, it does, um, it, I believe it is able to accomplish this just because if you look at um, the involvement in other states, they have, you know, not only schools, uh, churches, healthcare, like little small healthcare centers, like urgent cares and Planned Parenthoods, um, big hospitals, medical schools. So, um, using these um, outlets, I, the, it allows them to uh, uh, educate and hopefully um, try to uh, address the issue of teen pregnancy and um, STIs uh, among uh, adolescent groups. So moving on to the second portion of this presentation, we've decided to revise the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan. So first, this intervention that we've revised will target the same age range, so it'll be about 12 to 19 years of age. Um, originally, the program was only specific to one ethnicity, so we're going to expand the program to move on to all different ethnicities, whether it be Caucasian Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, basically any ethnicity you'd find in Michigan, the program will have some kind of target towards it. Now, we're also going to expand to Detroit residents, other lower income cities in Michigan, and cities with more than 100 teen births. And originally the program was eight to 10 direct program hours, and we want to extend it to a week-long program that'll be offered or sponsored through school systems. Therefore, it'll reach more kids and um, having it be a week-long program versus just eight to 10 program hours will give it more time for the information to sink in and it'll stress the importance of teen prevention, pregnancy prevention. Now, the original program, there were six addition, there were six programs that fell under the umbrella of the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan. So instead of being required to offer just one, which would explain why the program was originally just eight to 10 program hours, we're gonna expand that and we're gonna include all six programs in that week long program. And one of the complaints with the program originally was that there was no reference number to call if the parents had questions or if even if the children had questions. There was no 100% accurate source of information to be able to have contact with if there were questions that arose. And then we're going to also continue the parental involvement, such as the talks and things like that, that the program originally had. So we have decided to choose three strengths that we're going to maximize. So the original program, the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan, focused just on African Americans and just in kind of the Detroit area. And while African Americans have the highest rate of teen births of all ethnicities, there are other ethnicities who also have high rates of teen pregnancy. So we're gonna expand the program, to not only focus on the Detroit area, but to also encompass other low-income school districts where other African-Americans will be able to be reached and other ethnicities, whether you're Caucasian, Hispanic, African-American, or any mix of all of the above, it'll give a greater reach of the program itself. Next, the program educated on the use of contraceptives in addition to promoting abstinence. So it gave teens the ability to be able to exercise some form of autonomy. So if they decided that they did still want to engage in intercourse, they would be able to have the correct knowledge on contraceptive use to hopefully prevent teen pregnancy. Now we've, had, we've decided to expand upon this. So the original program was eight to 10 hour session. 
Now this program will include all of the six approved programs and it'll maximize the exposure to the important material. So this program will be a week-long program and it'll give you know, these teens a chance to let the information absorb, to ask any questions that they have and things of that nature. And lastly, the other strength we wanted to maximize was parental involvement in the program. So we thought it was very important that parents were involved, A, so that they can answer questions for their children, and B, so that that relationship between parent and child can also become stronger. So the talk early and talk often meetings for parents to encourage the um, involvement is really important, but I think it should also be expanded to other convenient times. So oftentimes meetings aren't really held at times that work well for working parents. So we thought to expand to meetings on weekends, afternoon meetings, day meetings, things like that, so that we could involve as many parents as possible. I also think it's important, and we did as a group as well, to provide a question and answer session for parents. So, um, you know, the last bullet says providing a phone number for parents in case questions come up. That also holds true for children too, children, teens, adolescents, anyone going through these programs, it's very important that they have some kind of access to question and answers where they can call in if they feel uncomfortable asking, you know, their parents a question or something like that. They have a resource to be able to go to to make good decisions. Now, as we were going through the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Initiative of Michigan, we noticed that there was quite a few weaknesses. So first off, participants didn't have access to a resource that answered questions other than their parents. So having a phone number like a 1-800 number is very important for two reasons. First of all, if parents have questions that they can't answer for their teen, it's important that they have a resource that they can call to get accurate information especially if for some reason they couldn't attend like a talk early, talk often section or something like that. It's very important to have this kind of resource. And also the same number would be able to be called by teens in order to make sure that they were able to have their questions answered if they were uncomfortable talking to their parents about certain questions. Another thing we noticed was that there was no outreach program in schools and there was only a very select number of locations that these programs were offered in. So we figured that we would gear the program more towards school systems, changing it to implementing it in the classroom so that it's assured that the highest number of young adults will be targeted and various locations throughout you know, Michigan. And the normal program itself was exclusive for ethnicity. So in revamping the program, for all school systems, it would assure that not just African Americans were targeted, but all ethnicities, which is really important because the Hispanic population also has a very high rate of teen pregnancy. They're the second highest rate of teen pregnancy. And in the original program, they weren't targeted by you know, the program itself. So it's very important that this program encompasses more ethnicities than just purely African Americans because the problem is not you know, localized to them. You know, Caucasian children, Caucasian teens, Caucasian young adults, all of them are still getting pregnant. So it's very important that the program itself encompasses all of that. And lastly, the last weakness we chose to focus on was that the original program was very short. So it was only like an eight to 10 hour session of direct contact, wasn't really a lot of time for the information to absorb and things like that. So we figured that it would be important to make it a week-long program or something kind of similar to that and that um, all of the six programs that were approved for the program would be included in the week-long session, therefore giving the teens as much access to the information as physically possible. Thank you so very much for tuning into our presentation on teen pregnancy prevention. We look forward to watching each and every one of your presentations, and we hope everyone has a wonderful remainder of their semester. Thank you.